Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Abdullah Samir podcast. And today I am joined by special guest Rose. Rose, how's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. So for those of you who are new here, I have this now on podcast format. So check it out on your favorite podcasting uh, platform, whether it's Stitcher, iTunes, whatever you like, you can actually listen to this on there. So if it's easier for you rather than on YouTube, this is a, the alternative platform. It's usually posted a couple hours after the fact. So if you haven't subscribed to that, please do subscribe on there um, and you'll get notified for when the new episodes come out. So enough about that. Episode 64. How's it going, Rose? I am feeling good. A bit cold over here, but uh, I do have my jacket next to me. So <laughs> if I do get colder, I'll pop that on. So, yeah. <laughs> nice. It's cold here too. It's Canada. Mm -hmm. It's getting cold now. It's uh, summer is over and uh, it was a good summer. Um, yeah. Mostly staying at home summer, I guess, which could have been better, but mm -hmm. that's the way the, the, the world goes nowadays. So mm -hmm. so let's, let's get started. Let's get into it. So can you tell us a little bit more about your background? Yeah, so I am from Singapore, uh, born and bred there, uh, grew up there as well. Um, as uh, my family, so I am Malay Muslim. Uh, my family is, so usually the Muslims in Singapore are mostly Sunni Muslims, um, which is also with Malaysia and Indonesia. Most in that region are Sunni Muslims, um, but we do have uh, Shia Muslims as well, but uh, they are in a minority. Mm, what else can I say or talk about in terms of my religious, family? Religious, mm -hmm. family, like religious family? Yes. So um, in Singapore, we have, well, the Muslim label, or I would say, you know, people who are Muslims, uh, there are different like levels or tiers, I would say, in Singapore. Uh, there are the religious ones, um, or I would say, there's like the religious ones who are in the eyes of a Singaporean would be considered as normal Muslims, which are the ones who, uh, you know, they pray five times a day, you know, practice uh, Islam as is per usual, as how it is. <laughs> and then you... Uh, and normally these people, uh, like myself and my family, would wear the hijab, like the, 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 the uh, women. And then there's also like the religious, like Muslims, you know, like there's, there's like this uh, stigma of being religious and then um, like being normal. I, I don't uh -huh. know how to place it, you know, it's yeah. like in terms of like, being religious, it's like really going to, uh, for example, instead of going to a normal um, uh, public school, you go to an actual madrasa that's five days, you know, like like they go there as their normal education instead of going to like a madrasa once a week or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so in this sort of um, schools, the, the five five days a week, um, like the, the school that they would choose their madrasas, yep. um, they on top of like the normal edu education um, that they would normally study in Singapore, uh, like science, math, all of this, uh, adding on to that would be the Islamic studies. So this would be, you know, if some, if you know someone who is studying in this way, you'll be like, whoa, like, <laughs> you know, they're really in like a, a more religious, yeah, more intense um, yeah. family, I would say, in terms of uh, um, the, the application of, yeah, that. Islamic beliefs, yeah. Uh, Are really they, um, um, Mm -hmm. Are those um is it is it a lot of people that are like very religious like that or are they a minority? Would you say? I would say that they are in a minority, but I have to say that I did not really mix so much with oh, uh, yeah. this crowd. Yeah, because it's okay. like you know you gotta be either in like a madrasa school in order to have that sort of oh, connection. Yeah. So mm -hmm. for me, I did not really see a lot of that. Okay. Uh, like during my time in Singapore, so. Mm -hmm. So you were more like, you went to like normal school and all that, but you were mm -hmm. a job. Your mm -hmm. family was, uh, would you say your family was deeply religious, played five times a day, all mm -hmm. of that? Yeah, like normal oh. Muslims, you know, like okay. pray five times a day, read the Quran, yep. pay zakat, uh, fast, or in Singapore you say puasa, um, uh, during the Ramadan, and uh, for, like my family would go for, um, like, you know, the start of the Islamic calendar? Yeah. Like, 
and then there would be some sort of like festivity or and uh, like prayers that you can do. Oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So we would go to this sort of um, events, I would say. Um, and then there are like the other tier of Muslims where, you know, their family are not so strict. Uh, they would, you know, pray, but they won't particularly go to the mosque to mm. do like these extra prayers and stuff like that. Uh, like to them, it's not really a priority. Uh, so uh, you have that. And usually in these sort of um, families, they don't, like uh, the parents don't put this like onus on their their daughters to wear the hijab. Oh, yeah. Whereas for my family, uh, they, I started young, like um, you know, to wear like the training hijab. Um, and in in Malay, it's called anak tudung, so it's just basically like a small scarf, head scarf. Oh yeah, yeah. And um, it's, so it's the like one that has a hole in it already, right? You yeah, just yeah, pull yeah. It on yeah, yeah. You just put it on top. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's like the, the most simplest and easy, you yeah. know, way to get a kid to be like, yeah, what's up? I mean, yeah. I'm ready. I'm going. I'm going to school, or yeah. I'm, no, I'm going out. So. Yeah. And what uh, age is that? Like usually started at. Uh, for me, it started around uh, because I was also going to madrasa like once a week. Uh, so then I would wear that. But um, like, you know, training, like practicing this, started around the age of five, six. Jeez, yeah. it's pretty yeah. young. Eh? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's so, interesting that um, mm -hmm. you know Muslim families tend to start the daughters wearing hijab, which is. At an age where it, it doesn't really matter because you're just a child, right? Yeah. Literally speaking, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yet they complain about, you know, sexualizing, you know, non-Muslim sexualizing women. But mm -hmm. isn't the hijab, do you think that the, the hijab is a sort of sexualizing of a woman as well? Or like a young child even? I feel that for me that they shouldn't be... Or I would say, like you know, this practice should not be coming into place when a, a child is still young, because mm. they have yet to understand why they have to wear this. You know, sometimes the tactic is that oh, you should wear this, otherwise you might go to hell. It's, you know, this sort of words yeah. is not really yeah. great for children to hear. You know, <laughs> yeah. Um, or um, for example. Uh, like especially coming to the age of uh, puberty, um, yeah. then this would be, I would suppose this would be more in terms of like the Malaysian side of things because they, uh, in school in normal schools they are allowed to wear hijab, uh, but then in Singapore, if you are in like a normal uh, public school, essentially because Singapore is a secular country, uh, they don't allow this. Really? They don't, yeah, they don't allow um, like for uh, their children to wear you know hijab. Like this is not the case. Um, there was wow. like a case like I don't know, I think in the nineties or something um, or early two thousands, where a family was a Muslim family wanted their kid to wear the hijab to school, but then yeah. the school was like, no, you can't because it's not oh. you know it's not permitted. You know, um, so there was like a big hoo ha about it, but then eventually it kind of died away and. So even still now, like you're not allowed to wear um, this job in school. Um, so young kids, you mean? Like, but not yeah. not like like teenagers could wear. No, no, no. Even in teenagers, for example, uh, in Singapore we have primary school, which is uh, six to twelve, and then secondary school is uh, thirteen till, depending on you know sixteen or seventeen. Mm -hmm. So, in this case, uh, even during that time, you're a teenager after puberty, you're not allowed to wear. Uh, only after, for example, you like uh, if you go into junior college, then you still have to um, like follow the school rules of because they have uniforms essentially. Oh yeah, yeah. Singapore, everyone has uniforms. It's uh, only if you go to, for example, uh, to take a polytechnic course. Mm -hmm. You know, after uh, your secondary school education, if you go to polytechnic, then from there. Everyone wears whatever they want. You okay. can wear the hijab if you want to. Yeah. Um, so that's fine. But if you go to JC, junior college, then in that sense, you have to use wear the uniform and not you know, be able to wear the hijab if you want to. Um, so yeah, that's like how it is. So, in mm -hmm. so how do Muslim families like reconcile that? So like in your case, for example, mm -hmm. 
uh, you left Islam. We didn't get to you leaving Islam yet, but you left Islam three years ago. So you're an mm -hmm. adult now. Mm -hmm. uh, you had to leave, you know, Singapore. We'll talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. But just just to, for people to understand the background and, and for me to understand the background, because my experiences in Canada are very different. Mm -hmm. OK, so uh, maybe we can compare that a bit. But just, to, oh, yeah. just for me to understand, especially. So you didn't wear hijab to school, but you wore it at home. Like I didn't, I don't get that. Yeah, yeah. So, so the way that it works, for example, is uh, you don't wear the hijab when you're in school, but let's say you go home and then after that you want to go out, then you would have to wear it. Yeah, it's like you know, as long as you're not in school, you're not gonna be wearing it because it's against the school rules, right? <laughs> so, so yeah, weird. it's really weird, right? Because for me, I understand that, for example, in the UK or uh, Canada, yeah. you know, you guys don't really have like a uniform. Yeah, well, they, they do have, like my, my son goes to uh, Catholic <laughs> school and they have uniform, but yeah. they're allowed to wear hijab there. Mm, interesting. I mean, frankly speaking, there's probably, I don't want to say for sure there's more Muslims in the Catholic school. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably there's probably more Muslims. There's probably more. It's close. Either there's more Muslims or there's a, like a very large number of Muslims compared to Christians in the school. The reason they go to Catholic school is we have this weird. There's some historical reason why I don't know why, but there's a historical reason why the Catholic system is funded. So we have two systems. We have a Catholic system, and we have like another public school system, just a general. And you can choose to put your kid in either one of them. Both of them, you don't pay any fees. But the only difference is in the Catholic school, um, you have to take a religion class every year, which is a Christian class. But again, because it's so multicultural, it's like kind of, you know, washy kind of. It's not like it's religion, but it's it's also like it, they don't force you to do anything you're not comfortable with. And mm -hmm. but it's still also it, as part of the, um, you know, as part of the secularism here, everyone's allowed to wear hijab even at school that's considered like a personal choice if you wear a crucifix mm -hmm. i'm kind of shocked to hear that in singapore you can't wear oh, hijab yeah, yeah. in school yeah so, so the really religious muslims must not send their kids to school then because then they don't want their daughter going out without hijab right yeah so that's the thing like that's why we have the madrasas oh yeah and so in, <laughs> you know in a way that like, that kind of so resolves the, oh, yeah. the, the thing but then also madrasas are actually quite ex expensive so oh, yeah. for me like when i when i do meet someone who you know do go to madrasas like for me i'm like huh this person or this family must be a, you know quite well to do um, in that sense, because they're able to do, you know, like send the kids to this place, which are usually a bit more expensive than uh, like the, the school. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because uh, madrasas, I believe, they are usually private. So, yeah. We have we have those. Uh, we have Islamic schools here, too. Mm -hmm. And they're not, at least, okay, it depends from province to province. But in Ontario, where I live, the, the government doesn't pay for anything. So basically what happens is you're paying like, Anywhere from like when I, I mean, this was a long time ago, it was like 300, but now it's closer to a thousand dollars a month mm. per child. Oh. So that's like a lot of money. Uh, mm. Most people, most, most, most working families cannot afford a thousand dollars a month. A thousand dollars a month is like the rent. Yeah, uh, exactly. Actually, the rent is more than that. So it's like probably like 60% to 70% of what average person pays for rent. Average person's paying like 1500 to maybe about 1500 for rent, let's say for mm -hmm. a two bedroom. So this is like doubling. You know, if you're paying fifteen hundred for rent, and then you're paying another thousand dollars for one or two kids for Islamic school, I mean, mm -hmm. that's a lot of money. So me, my wife didn't work, and so when I was Muslim, I actually put my kids in Islamic school because, mm -hmm. even though that you know I didn't have any daughters at the time, it wasn't because of that, but it was just we were you know we were hearing these things from scholars saying don't put your kids in Islamic school. You want to make don't put your kids in public school. Sorry, yeah. you want to make sure your kids get the proper Islamic education. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we put the kids in these schools where they do all the classes and they have Islam and Arabic and stuff like that. But, you know, in retrospect, I, I you know, I think it was a waste of money to do that because the, the schools I put my kids in, they weren't as good, in my opinion, as a public school system because, of course, they were privately funded. They were not, they had, you know, they had donations as well, a lot of donations and they were connected to the mosque. And the, the main reason wasn't for academic excellence. It was mm -hmm. to keep people, keep your kids away from haram, right? Mm -hmm. So, but at the end of the day, I think even the Islamic schools, you know, when you put your kids in Islamic school, you you still have that same struggle of this. The kids are going to be kids. They're all, they're all yeah. going to get into bad things and, you know, drugs and music, music, you know, <laughs> and TV, the terrible music, you know, the worst problem of all music. Kids are watching oh, music. 
It, it's it's like those uh, old Christian fundies that you know they they don't want the kids playing cards and uh, like my my wife's grandpa mm-hmm. he thinks you know playing playing cards are from the devil or something and like you know that generation of TV yeah, is yeah. bad and you know anyways so back to your story let's let's so that that's interesting that's very really surprising so so you you grew up you know Muslim religious religious family and what happened like how did you and uh, find what what made you so you you found my blog apparently so can we, oh, yeah, yeah. Can you tell us about that. Oh my god, so um, give you a bit of a background about how I was as a Muslim. Um, yeah, definitely pray five times a day, uh, especially during uh, polytechnic. Uh, that was when, you know, you can wear your hijab to school and pretty much you are on your own time schedule. This is what you can do. Um, and for me, when I was in polytechnic, uh, my classes would be you know, kind of sometimes ending at 4 p.m. So around the Zohor time, that is when I would have to like pray at school. So in that sense, uh, when other, uh, you know, we would have our breaks. Um, and uh, for me, I would spend that break time eating and then taking wudu and going for my prayers in a like a in a, a staircase area of the school you know where no one is uh, walking about so uh, that was uh, how I was as a Muslim uh, before I left um, yeah and uh, when I started to have doubts well this is the thing about my story which is um, like you know for me I did all the practice and everything like this also one it's for the religion yeah um and two is also for my family um because they put so much importance on it that i felt like yeah i need to do this you know and when i felt like you know sometimes uh, i didn't really want to do it i uh i said like no i must do this you know i need to keep myself stronger to the faith so that was also the, one of the reasons why I started to pray um, in uh, the school facility, um, you know, just to keep on that that uh, that iman, you know, strong. So, for this, um, when I uh, decided to, you know, really take a look at my life and see what is it that I'm unhappy with, because at the time as well, I was just like, you know, I did not really feel happy about. Um, being, I would say, in a place where I could not be myself. Mm. Um, and I am the sort of person who loves music. I love going to gigs. I love, um, you know, hanging out with my friends at night as well. You know, you're not doing anything. You're just hanging out with your friends. Yeah. And sometimes that just can going be like... Out, just going out. Yeah. Being a teenager. Yeah. Living your life. Exactly. Yeah. So sometimes that like can crop up to be an issue, but, um, you know, I'm like the last child. So sometimes I do get my leeway. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and so for me, once I like, you know, I will go to gigs with my hijab on, like, that's not a problem for me. Like I'm fine with that, Yeah. you know? And, uh, like it's really nice to be, you know, experiencing what you love, exploring new things um but then there are times for example when um my mom really would be like uh, that that uh, saying the comments like she's not directing at me but mostly like indirectly like saying like oh you know people who go to concerts or people who go to uh, and they're dancing like you know like saying it as if it's a very horrible thing right yeah very horrible thing like like yeah. it's so bad like how yeah. could you you know something yeah. like this so like even though it's not directed at me yeah i felt like oh like you know maybe i should be doing this you know it's yeah. like guilt tripping essentially oh. um yeah so like she didn't do it that often but for me it just kind of rings in my head you know yeah like, um, and maybe i'm doing something wrong but um uh eventually i was just like you know let's Let's uh, do an experiment on how I feel about the hijab, you know. Uh, so 
I started to go out without the hijab on. Um, yeah, this was a very difficult uh, decision and very difficult, um, I would say, to execute this to me was really scary because especially the first time and I had a panic attack and this was my first ever panic attack. After that, I never really gotten any. So okay. this is like the only time I've had one. Um, and when I went out without my hijab, what I would do is that I would go out with, with it because you know maybe a family member is at home, so I just have to wear it when I go out. And then I would go to a nearby shopping center um, and go to the washroom, take it off, and all. But I would always have like a hat with me, just in case, you know, just to cut like like uh, if someone notices me or if I feel like someone's looking at me, I'll just look down. Um, so in that sense, I didn't want to be caught. Like that fear of oh, I, I cannot be caught without my hijab on is so in your face that, you know, you mm. feel like, why it's do I terrifying. feel like, Yeah, it's really terrifying. Yeah. And you know, it really makes you think like, why do I feel this way? Mm. You know, so when I was thinking about this, like, why do I feel this way? Why is it that I feel that my hair is a skin, you know, like showing my skin is something wrong. And I, I uh, you know, it's not like you're walking around in a bikini. Like, obviously, <laughs> you're going to be like, people be like, what the hell is wrong with you? you yeah. know, even normal people will be like, what is going on? Yeah. You know, so in this sense, like, I was just like asking myself these questions. Like, why do I feel this way when it's just my hair? Why do I feel so wrong about my body? Um, so I had to question this. Uh, before I did the experiment, I was like, yeah, you know, I didn't really question um the, the, the idea of wearing a hijab. Like, why should we do this? Yeah, you should do this because we want to cover up your all right, okay, yeah, sure, I'll take it. But then after I did the experiment, I understood that feeling of fear and, you know, the, how being so uncomfortable without it made me feel. And then it made me try to, you know, figure out like, why do I feel uncomfortable? So that's when, you know, I kind of started to go deeper and deeper in, uh, into asking, into questioning really. Uh, my faith and uh, the religion that I grew up in. So from there, I, yeah, uh, there was this one time, like the first time I'm going out, I met my friend. Uh, she is a Muslim, but she doesn't really practice it. So like, she's like, yeah, fun. it's cool. Like, it's not a problem. Like, I don't, have, I don't find it a problem at all. Um, so she really helped me um, when we were kind of like close to my workplace. And in my workplace, I, I wore the hijab. Um, but then I, we were kind of like walking around that was close to my workplace. And I knew that uh, if someone from the workplace kind of like knew or saw me without my hijab, they'll be like, you know, talking about it. So for me, that fear of other people talking about it when I'm not ready is really scary. So uh, at that time, I was in a convenience store near the workplace and I really had a hard time breathing and I didn't know what was happening. Like I was just like, <laughs> like, like really, you know, my heart was pounding, really sweating. Uh, and my friend was like, you, are you okay? Like, just breathe. Okay. Like, you know, really helping me out. Um, yeah, because I was having a panic attack only then I knew so, what it was. So this just showed like, this is how, how difficult it is to take off the hijab. It's uh, not yeah. at all an easy thing at all. And I know my wife actually, even though, you know, we were not, she's not from a Muslim family, but even for her, just with her friends and it was very difficult and she was still Muslim at the time, but it's tough uh, to take off the hijab. So you were still Muslim at the time and you were, you were just thinking of not, so you were still Muslim, but you just wanted to kind of express yourself. You didn't feel like you wanted to wear the hijab anymore. And even as a Muslim, this was like incredibly tough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, for me, um, that hijab, uh, because it, for me, the hijab is an identity. And even before, like, you know, me living in Islam, like when, when I am looking at other Muslims, you know, uh, especially Muslim women, if they're wearing the hijab, I'm like, hey, you know, we have a connection, something like this. And so that's how, so this is the, the thing that I don't really like about um, the way that uh, the dynamic is like in, um, 
I would say in Singapore or in other countries really from what mm -hmm. I've seen mm -hmm. is that if you're a Muslim woman who has, who's wearing the hijab and you want to take it off because you know you don't feel like it anymore you don't really want to wear it anymore um you know personal reasons or reasons that for example maybe it's too hot right like you don't yeah. really want it anymore um other muslims who are either people who are wearing the hijab or people who are not wearing the hijab men uh, sometimes even non-muslims would be <laughs> questioning it like why are you removing it you know so in this sense i don't really like that yeah that identity um labeling this person like oh you, she should she's wearing it because she is um what is that word uh she is supposed to be promoting islam mm. uh and by the act of removing it it seems like there's something wrong with islam right when oh, know, yeah. of course there's something yeah. wrong in islam but um so, they, so they, this they're taking it as a polit they're taking your hijab as a political statement basically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is yeah. you're saying that at you know it's not a political statement for many Muslim women, it's just a decision, a personal decision. Just like you know, for example, I mean, we can look at Muslim men. Some Muslim men, you know, they stop praying. Some of them will be will uh, grow their beard for religious reasons. Although the the thing about the beard is it's easier as a man because a lot of non-Muslims have beards, but no non-Muslims wear hijab. So yeah. you know, unfortunately, with the hijab, it's something that's unique. To Muslim women that nobody else does. So when you take it off, suddenly everyone's like, "Oh, why is she doing that?" Whereas mm -hmm. with the beard, nobody cares if you shave your beard. I, as a Muslim, yeah, some people might care, but then there's also a lot of Muslims that don't have a beard. So it's it's more difficult as a Muslim woman mm -hmm. to take that step. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I would agree uh, a lot in that sense as well. Um, and in terms of uh, our right, right, uh, since we're talking about this. Um, what I've noticed is that there's a lot of hypocrisy um, in terms of uh, whether or not a person should be covering up. So in in a lot of regions, I would say that why like people will question like why is is she not covering up? Or mm -hmm. even for like a Muslim woman who's not even wearing the hijab, like if they're just wearing a t-shirt and pants, you know, just pretty normal. Uh, people will still ask like, oh, why aren't you, you know, wearing the hijab, asking these questions. But for example, let's say a man who uh, is walking around without his shirt, you know, his belly yeah. showing, um, yeah. he's wearing, uh, well, let's say he's wearing long pants, but his belly is showing, you know, that's mm -hmm. part of the art right, for, for men. Yeah. Um, and let's say that he's not, uh, like he's in the company of people that he shouldn't be doing that. People are not going to question him. Mm. Right, like people are not gonna be like, "Hey, uh, shouldn't you be wearing like a shirt or something?" Yeah, people are not going to say that. So, uh, in that sense, there's uh, a lot of hypocrisy towards a uh, woman, um, you know, in terms of the arat uh, in Islam. Mm. Yeah. So, mm. so you're saying there's a there's a sort of uh, double standard here where yeah, like yeah. women women are actually considered that oh, you need to wear hijab, you need to dress like this, you can't wear like a t-shirt, you have to dress, but like like a man can get away with showing his aura. Aura means mm -hmm. basically the part of the body that you have to cover mm -hmm. in Islam. For men, it's only between the knees and like the belly button or something. But for women, yeah. like the whole body, including the hands. Some people even say the face. <laughs> I mean, although well, that's a minority opinion. Uh, yeah, yeah. But it, basically for women, it's much tougher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For yeah. So, 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 what, so you had this panic attack. You had this struggle in taking off the hijab. But did you, you ended up taking off the hijab after that? And how did that yeah. affect your family? Like, what happened? Yeah, yeah. so um, the reason why I was uh, going out, like, once in a while without a hijab. So this was, like, how I wanted to understand my feelings and understanding of Islam uh, and whether or not I want to continue with it, um, which is through this experience. So once I had that, like, panic attack, I was like, oh, you know, this is, doesn't feel good. But after a while, I got over that. And I was like, you know, reflecting on this and asking myself all these other questions but in the meantime i was also you know in a way living a double life so sometimes i would go out with friends and with our hijab and then i would go to work um mm. with the hijab and you know you know making up appearances to my family because if they knew that i wasn't wearing the hijab uh they would be 
for me, I felt that it was better to, to essentially like do this experiment myself because I don't want it to be affected by like, you know, external influences, for example, my family to make me like take a step back mm-hmm. because I knew like that would just totally like my that would my, ruin my, the whole thing. Yeah, that, that would exactly. ruin the, the personal would, experience. Yeah. So you wanted mm-hmm. to have an authentic experience and, yeah. and decide for yourself mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. without external, you know, cult, like, um, you know, family pressure mm-hmm. kind of pushing you back towards mm-hmm. what they wanted versus what mm-hmm. you wanted. You wanted to make the decision that was best for yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, you already have like cultural societal factors mm-hmm. that is already kind of in your head, right? So it doesn't like you really have that. So you don't really want an immediate family reaction to that um, sort of yeah, uh, experience. Yeah. 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 While you're trying, you're trying to make baby steps towards living an authentic life. Already, your family is kind of putting you in the situation where you have to live a double life, mm-hmm. not because you want to live a double life. Of course, you want to tell your family, you want to tell mm-hmm. everybody, and everybody, everybody I know who, like, for example, left Islam or you know took off a hijab or you know whatever. Even let's say the gay and the the family doesn't know. They want to tell their family members. They, it's just that the, sometimes the consequences are too high, and the cost mm-hmm. of telling them. It's just not worth it. So they just have yeah. to live a double life, and it, yeah. nobody likes living. A, nobody likes living a double yeah, life. It sucks. It sucks. Yeah, <laughs> we all want to be accepted for who we are. We want people to know and love us, and that's what intimacy is. Intimacy mm-hmm. is to expose yourself and who you are and all of your weaknesses to someone else. And mm-hmm. when you don't have that with even your own parents, and you have to hide things from them, that that sucks basically, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it really. I mean, you don't want to be lying to them. Right, like no yeah. one wants to lie to, to to a family member about your own authentic self. But if you're doing the risk assessment and you see that if I were to do this now, like they would probably, I don't know, throw you out and yeah. all, the, all the horrible things, then it's it's really difficult to to uh, take those steps um, comfortably or or you know make it into something that's comfortable for yourself. Um, because you you feel like oh it's like a hard choice right oh should I um, live my authentic self or should I uh, be disowned by my, my by my own family right it's it's really difficult, mm, it's difficult exactly yeah. yeah so um so just to just to remind anyone that's just joining now I'm speaking to Rose uh, fatally honest she has a YouTube channel as well which is linked right in the title you can just click on the name fatally honest it'll take you to a channel do subscribe to her and support her she makes some really nice interesting videos not just on Islam but on cultural on culture on sexuality on different things like that so do check out her channel um, and she's an ex-muslim woman from Singapore no longer in Singapore we're gonna talk about that so uh, those of you who are just joining that's who I'm speaking with so let's continue from there uh, so what ended up happening after that like so you you took off the hijab. Did you tell your family or what were you doing? Yeah, so um, I, I really remember this day. Uh, I, I, after like a few times going out with a hijab and stuff like this, it, it, it took a while. Like um, I think I started like taking off the hijab in 2016. And then it's like what, half a year process for me or eight months, something like this uh, process for me. And I read a lot more about Islam, mm. um, not just you know reading the Quran, which is in Arabic, and you don't know what you're reading. It's yeah. very, you know, so uh, the connection of understanding the meaning is difficult there. So what I did was to read translations. Uh, so this is the part where uh, a lot of, for example my uh, muslims would say like oh you shouldn't be reading the translations maybe really? they're translating yeah so in, because in, over here it's it's uh-huh. actually encouraged to read the translation over there you're uh-huh. saying in the muslim countries uh actually singapore is not a muslim country but like you're saying over there the culture is that you just read it in arabic only yeah that was like my uh i would say like in the madrasa they would have uh like you know they have the the um, uh, all the surahs uh, in, in the book but then they would have like Malay, uh, Malay translations on it it's, and for me I'm like sometimes it just doesn't make sense mm-hmm. um, so uh, like in that sense I wasn't really like when I was young I wasn't really interested in like understanding the, the surahs at all um, so okay we have to like especially in madrasa what they would do is that they would essentially 
ask you to, you know, you, you study FK, studying Tauhid, uh, Sirof, um, and uh, what, a part of it is to learn Arabic, but uh, it really depends on like the module that you're taking. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like really basic. So like uh, saying like, oh, learning how to say like I, or because, mm-hmm. you know, Arabic, it has what um, they have like the different ways of saying like for him and for her. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, from yeah, him. Arabic is a tough language to learn. Yeah, very tough, very tough yeah. language. So uh, for me, <laughs> um, when I was younger, what I would do is like if we were having um, the examination, I would be like looking at my friends, <laughs> <laughs> like paper, I'm like, hey, can you help me out? Yeah. I don't know what this is. Yeah. But um, yeah, but uh, when what they would do is essentially they would ask you to memorize the surah so that you can use it for prayers. And uh, you have to essentially pass like how many surahs um, like during your year in the madrasa and then be able to like say, yes, I've memorized this. And then you would then be able to use it during your, you know, when you're praying. Mm-hmm. Um, and memorization is not my, it's not my, my, my best skill at all. <laughs> uh, so I had like a real struggle with it. Um, and another thing that uh, madrasas would do, uh, this started later on, like when, you know, after my puberty and stuff, is that uh, in, during the times, if, you, if your schooling is within the temple uh, of Zohor or Asar, mm-hmm. um, especially for the girls, what they would do is that if you're, you're, if you're having like your period, you have to tell the 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 uh, your teacher and you have to tell them like, hey i'm having my period now um oh, yeah. so they're going to take down they're gonna take down that you're having your period now and then if you uh you know if you were to say that you're having your period again like yeah. you know the next two weeks they'll be yeah. like oh your schedule is out of whack what is wow. you know, what's happening yeah Genius. so that yeah, so that's quite strict. Like for me, I was just like, "What is happening here?" So wow, this is the school you said. Yeah, yeah. so this is the madrasa. Like, oh the, uh, wow, wow, yeah, that's yeah. intrusive, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's really intrusive. Like, yeah, you know, I mean, like, I understand. Like, okay, maybe this person wants to use the excuse of uh, yeah. periods. Yeah, but like, it's still very like what you know. That's uh, crazy. Like, okay. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> insane. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So so um so you so you started reading the Quran in in uh, Malay or English or what, what, what uh, in, in, uh, so like what I would uh, I would do is that um when I was having like I didn't understand or like did not really you know find that uh, a surah was just really weird uh, I would go to uh, English translations and read them be like okay yeah. Uh, you know, I've um, also like during that time, I was also reading uh, more about uh, Christianity, uh, reading more about Judaism. And in our school, of course, you know, uh, they taught us that okay, these are all the Abrahamic faiths, and Islam is the last one. So they, it's the truest um, religion. Like it, it's the true religion. Yeah. So you should follow it. You know, it's the last one in the book in in, in the in the series. So um, in this case. For me, I was like, okay, you know, I was taking it for granted that that it is the, the the true religion. But once I was reading all of this text in English and see the similarities within Christianity, within Judaism, I was like, how can this be the truest scripture, who's coming from God? You know, and and you're just reading a bit more and more and more. And in you know, in the end, I just felt so tired of it all Mm -hmm. because you get to a point where, okay, all of this um, uh, like words and stories really, okay, like fine, you know, but then you're making laws based on that. You know, based on the time where, where, where the time is just so different to modern current world, um, how is it possible that uh, the law hasn't been changed accordingly to the times that we have right now? Mm-hmm. Um, and why do we still have to adhere to this? Uh, like for me, uh, as an ex-Muslim, I would say that it's fine if you want to pray five times a day, uh, five times a day. Like, you know, I have no problems with Muslims at all. Like. 
you do what what you want to do uh, as a Muslim, as long as you're not uh, a harming another person, b um, what's that called restricting someone else's life choices. Uh, like if another Muslim wants to remove their hijab, then a Mu another Muslim shouldn't be saying like, oh no, you shouldn't be doing that, you know. Um, but unfortunately, the the way that Islam is right now is not very, um, I would say, open or friendly towards change. Um, I mean, for I'm, I'm not very particularly sure on how is it, it is there in Canada, like, uh, you know, liberal Muslims and stuff like this. Um, because in Singapore, I would say that if you do, I mean, you can have liberal Muslims, but in terms of uh, important topics like FGM, for example, it's not really something that uh, is widely talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So in Canada, um, we have a lot of liberal Muslims. I'd say, mm -hmm. I don't know. It's kind of hard to define what liberal Muslim is, because some people are liberal, but they still support weird Islamic like bad things in Islam, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd say majority though, like truly speaking, majority don't pray five times a day. And I think mm -hmm. this is in all countries, not just Canada. But yeah. um, in Canada, like m my family is exceptionally liberal. We're from Kenya. And they don't even, they don't like, they didn't even mind that I left Islam. They don't even care. They're like, mm -hmm. not don't care, but like some of them, the more religious ones were like crying and sad, but the less religious ones are like, it's up to you. You can do what you want. And you know, Indian Muslims tend to be more, liberal than pakistani muslims that's what i found mm -hmm. my family comes goes from india um and yeah like you were saying you know when it comes to you know leading the translation you know there was a comment in the there was a comment someone left that the, the ustad or the teacher doesn't care if you understand they just want you to read it yeah. uh, when you start reading it for yourself you you see a totally different um you know image and you get a totally different idea so before we before we continue i just want to say thank you so much to david wood he just gave an extremely generous donation for my wife uh more than the biggest donation i've ever got actually this is crazy like this is above and beyond and you know david wood you know honestly you are such a kind you know <laughs> kind person and i really do appreciate you and all you did you know also you helped me leave islam and you had an influence on you know obviously i don't believe in christianity but you are truly honestly a good person i, I truly believe that i don't in, and i'm not just saying that because you gave me a donation and and you know there's other people who i i won't go on the platforms and won't work with them but i would i do work with david wood because i do think that he he hits the mark over and over again um david wood i am you know i really appreciate it thank you so much i i had to say that sorry to interrupt a, a conversation rose but you no, know it's good like, yeah this is it's mvp this is crazy i really do appreciate it so and uh courtesy of muhammad hijab who sent me a new kind of financial support yeah that's funny how that how that sort of um you know <laughs> that 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 uh how that happened you know trying to get trying to get you know people financially try you know this is what happens to ex-muslims and activists who speak against islam they try to hit you where it hurts the most with which is financially because you you depend on this when you when you start doing this full time you need the money to continue doing it because this is what you do for a living now. You, this is your 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 life, right? You're actually building content. You're helping con. You're creating content for people to leave Islam, or at least to know, you know, to be a little bit more skeptical and not necessarily go down too deep into the rabbit hole. Yesterday, uh, David Wood was having a conversation with a Muslim convert, and you know, he was just giving him things to think about because you never know. Sometimes, if you don't have that pushback what we're going to find is the dawah and the, you know, the Islamic apologetics is going to shape the world. Mm -hmm. and, and on top of it, the, the high birth rates, we're going to end up in a world where we have so many, mm -hmm. everything is going to be Islam. And we don't like, do we want to live in a world where, you know, this, this, this strict system that controls everything in your life, including like the lives of non-Muslims, mm -hmm. we really want that worldview. No, we don't want that. We want, we mm -hmm. want, secularism we want freedom of religion we want to be able to blaspheme we want people to be able to leave islam or leave any religion frankly speaking yes. choose their own path right just like you wanted to choose your own path um so just want to say thank you to david Wood for that i really appreciate it so back to your story now um so so when you were reading these other stories of other religious books um you know did you find them to be did you feel like all all the religions are false or what did you did you find yourself inclining to any of these other religions like christianity or judaism uh, what was your perspective there? Mm. Mm, in terms of uh, the stories, you know, reading, 
I, I found a lot of similarities. It wasn't that I found any inclination to any one religion after reading, but just like, oh, okay. It, it's, uh, for me, I feel like it's more of a web of history, really. Um, and, you know, uh, history can be changed at a person's whim or an organization's whim. Um, and for me, uh, I would say that I'm not at all religious. I don't have any, like, feeling towards wanting to believe in a religion. Uh, I would call myself an agnostic, um, really. You know, uh, for example, I was listening to your interview uh, about, what is it called, uh, Muslim identity, like the ex-Muslim label. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was listening that, yeah, uh, this, um, I forgot his name, but uh, he calls himself an agnostic Muslim. But which is on faith? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I was like, yeah. Uh, I would say that a lot of people do have that labeling in their hearts, but they don't call themselves that. They just call themselves Muslims. Like they yeah. don't wanna, you know, they don't wanna out themselves by saying, oh, I I don't think I you know I really believe in Islam. Yeah. Like they don't wanna out themselves like that because okay. they understand like like that would not be a good thing. Like it's not normalized yet. So that's the thing, right? Um. That uh, even like I, I saw a comment earlier on where it says, "Oh yeah, Malays are, uh, you know, they would seem as a person who is a liberal Muslim, but once you touch on the things like, for example, the the Prophet Muhammad, or uh, uh, like other things like uh, eating pork, uh, then they would." Uh, be going on like full Muslim mode and telling you like, oh, what are you talking about? You know, this is this is not Islam. How, how can you say such things to me yeah. when they themselves are like, for example, drinking, you know. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. That is the weirdest thing ever. I always had a I always had a struggle with that. I don't understand people like that. I, mm -hmm. I, I believe, and I think you were probably in a similar situation. If Islam is true, then I need to do everything that Islam says because... Yeah what's going to happen to me otherwise and and not only i need to do everything that islam says for myself i need to make sure that everybody else does that for their own good for mm -hmm. their own protection from this god that will punish them and you know so like when i when in ramadan in canada i used to feel like i used to look at people eating and i used to be like oh my god all these people they're doing all these sins and they're going to be punished for this and i felt bad for them right I didn't hate them. I, I didn't have that perspective, but mm -hmm. I felt bad for them. And in the same thing you were saying that when you have, um, it's strange. You have people that they don't do any of these things yet. They still supposedly believe in Islam. It's really weird. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know what I mean, I, maybe they are a little bit agnostic and they really <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit skeptical, but they don't want to admit it to themselves. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They don't want to question it properly. I think that's the thing. And I think it's um, for them, maybe it's scary yeah. uh, to even like question um, something that they, their family has, you know, possibly taught them uh, in, in one way or another. Um, so I suppose in that sense, uh, they don't want to break the culture in, in that way, you know, uh, the way that they've grown up. Uh, even like, even though it is very clearly stated, like if you do this stuff, you will go to hell, right? Uh, for me as well, when I was a Muslim, like if someone were to tell me like, oh, you know, drinking alcohol and everything, like I'll be like, I'm so sure about that. Like, you know, maybe you need to to uh, um, think about your life a little bit or something like this. Um, you yeah. know, because for me, uh, especially with my parents, like the way I was brought up, like if you, like I was, you know, in terms of like sins that was totally like a no-no was, I mean, in Singapore, you can listen to music. Like for my family, it's not, not a problem. But, uh, you know, alcohol, like pork, you know, non-halal food, like you need to make sure that whatever you're eating is halal. Yeah. Like, you know, if there's no halal stamp, like certified by the Mu'is, the authority yeah. in Singapore, you're not going to eat it. Yeah. So that's like, whereas, for example, like, um, you know, that in Singapore, there's this like night festival, um, but in, in uh, local terms, you call it a pasar malam. It's like a... a um, Pasa means, uh, it's like a night market, essentially. So it, it, around these night markets, you would have like people selling food and stuff like that. Sometimes people would sell, uh, for example, like takoyaki. It's like a, a, a food um, from Japan, but they make there uh, in, in these uh, night markets. And 
people would buy like Muslims. I would see Muslims when I was a, a Muslim. I would see people, other Muslims, like buying it from such stores that don't even have like a certification. And yeah. I would be like, "Why are you doing? Why are you doing this? You know, like yeah. in my heart, I really truly really felt like yeah. they're doing something wrong." Yeah. So that was the sort of like mindset that I was in as a Muslim. So I definitely understand, you know, like the the how do you kind of fit that together like you know not- it's, um isn't it you know maybe what it is is for a lot of these people it's i want to call it a tribal thing they mm-hmm. it's become identity islam is an identity so mm-hmm. when you question islam even if they don't practice it themselves they'll you know they'll 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 fight back and they'll say no how dare you say that whereas they themselves are not properly practicing but it becomes mm-hmm. And if you push them, that's when they start to become a little bit hostile or they, you know, they can become um, even violent. For example, mm-hmm. your family members will love you. You know, you have this wall. So so what happened with your family then when you when you started to question and all of these things? Did, you didn't tell them yet. You, this this uh, came later, right? Yeah, yeah, this came later. So like when I was, you know, reading more and more uh, and of course, um, you know, going through the videos, like, oh, I was like, Muslims uh, living Islam on YouTube and I was like oh and then I found like this vice documentary and I was like oh okay they are actually Muslims who are living Islam and I was like okay this is in Britain interesting so you know for me it was really uh it's like mind-blowing that you could even live Islam like this was you know because in my world I was like what living Islam what are you talking about like, yeah you know something, right like no way there's no way so when i was you know going through this i was like so excited like my heart my heart was racing because of excitement yeah um so i was just like wow this is really like another world um so i watched like the vice documentary and went to other youtubers for example zara k uh and eventually i found your uh youtube as well and then from there i went on to your site which is incredibly helpful um especially because you come in into it in a very analytical uh, analytical sense uh, towards you know the scriptures as well as um, the laws really in regards to Islam and how it affects people. Yeah. So in this uh, case, I was just reading through your blog and I found myself really agreeing to a lot of what you were saying. Um, and also additionally, because for me, I understood that Islam does have like branches do you know different branches of uh like the way people can practice islam and you come from a background that i uh never even realized what that existed um because for me it's like okay sunni shia and then like you know for example um uh what's it called uh like salafi and all the different muslims yeah, yeah. so yeah yeah so for me I that was like my idea of how it branches out, but I did not know that there was, you know, a a a, a more uh, subcategory of such um, branches of Islam. So for me, it was very interesting to see how you transi- uh, transitioned from one to mm-hmm. another, and then after that to eventually leaving Islam. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and the way that uh, your family reacted to you know you. Um, doing, you know, th- through this process um, actually encouraged me to uh, eventually tell my uh, family that, oh, yeah, yeah like, like for me to, to, you know, just let it all out that you don't want to be a part of Islam um, because I don't want to be lying and I don't want to be, you know, not um, uh, essentially not living my authentic self anymore mm-hmm. uh, in this case. So when I left uh i remember clearly this day or so my family my parents would sometimes go to their home uh like they're they're retired so they would go to like a a place in malaysia um and they would essentially stay there for a few days and then they would come back so um for like medical appointments stuff like this so uh on a day where they decided to come back i uh texted my mom i said hey um just to let you know, I'm not going to wear the hijab. Like, I didn't want to say, like, 
you know, I hey, am gonna be living Islam. Like, you know, like, who does that over? Like, I don't do that over text. Like, this is something that you gotta. You know, really it, yeah, it's like it's like saying, "Hey, mom, uh, I'm gonna kill myself" or something like that. <laughs> it's like saying that. It's like, "Hey, um, <laughs> like, yeah, you don't want to get like make to have a heart attack, right?" Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I was just like telling her, like, "Hey, uh, when you, you know, when we come to pick you up, I, I'm just letting you know that because I don't want to shock you that uh, I'm not going to be wearing uh, uh, my job." And she's like, okay, dot, 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 because <laughs> um, writes that way. Like she always has like three dots at the end all the time. Like it doesn't yeah. matter if she's like happy or sad, it's just yeah. going to be dot, dot, dot. So, yeah. <laughs> so, and then she said, um, okay, but um, can you wear something that covers your head? Like, and I'm like, okay, fine. You know, I wear, I'll, I'll wear a hat. Like she, you know, it's like, uh, can you please like wear, wear like a, I don't know, like a hat or something. I'm like, yeah, were sure. you meeting in public or where were you meeting? Yeah. 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 So oh, it's like okay. in public. So, so essentially, um, we will pick, uh, them up, which is, um, in Woodlands Causeway link area. So all the Singaporeans would notice. <laughs> so, um, we would meet there and then we would eat, uh, at a nearby coffee shop and, yeah, I, I you know, uh, you know, I uh, greeted them, salam them, and we went to eat. And my parents didn't really show a lot of emotions. They were just like, hmm, okay. Like I think for them, it was really just a shock because, mm. like, they they didn't know how to process it or they didn't know how to react to it. So they just like kind of you know clo closed up uh, in that sense. Were um, you were you living with them at the time? Or you yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, in, in Singapore, it's really expensive to live on your own. Oh. Um, so, like most uh, people, uh, they would only leave the family home after they get married. Like, so this is like the concept. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, it's just really expensive in Singapore to to be yeah. you know, renting and stuff. Um, so, in this case, uh, yeah, I was still living with my parents. Um, and and you told them that you left Islam. What happened? No, no, not not at that point of time. Okay. Um, so I like they were like okay mm, sure and then we just ate and you know I was kind of hmm. like acting normal because I was really scared to like scare them away I mean yeah. I already did but uh, I didn't want to make it worse right in that sense so you know went back home uh, then they you know kind of went on as per usual so I was like trying to figure out like how do I inform them about my decision to leave. So what I did was that I decided to make a PowerPoint presentation because like, you know, for me, the way that I handle stressful situations is through humor. So I thought, I just like personally thought like, okay, this is like a way for me to explain to them and not like, uh, like not, not um, you know, cry, uh, without even being able to explain it to them because it's a very emotional, um, I would say, thing to experience, you know, telling your parents, religious oh, yeah. parents oh, about yeah. this. So for me, I was like, okay, let's uh, make a PowerPoint presentation of why I am living this now. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. So the, the fact is that I, like, to, to create humor because I'm just that sort of person is to, like, uh, put in fonts, you know, I didn't want it to be like serious, even though it's already a serious thing. So mm -hmm. um, for, my, for my sake, I was just like, okay, let's make everything Comic Sans, you know, to make it really funny. Um, oh no, Comic uh, Sans. Oh, oh yes, yes. Oh, that's that's the best font to use for serious, <laughs> serious uh, talks, you know. That, that so. font should be banned. That should be banned. Uh, <laughs> so you, must be, you must be the first woman in history to make a powerpoint presentation for her family on leaving islam do you have this presentation i think uh i'm not sure because it was oh, with my no. oily old um computer uh, yeah. i really wish i would have kept it like yeah but uh i, I appreciate it's lost oh, it, no because, that would have been amazing yeah, to yeah, show yeah. that on your channel I yeah, I'm, I'm really upset. Actually, when I was like making a video, I was just like, oh shit, yeah, I should have kept that presentation. Oh, but, um, so tell us what was in it. Like, like what was in it? Yeah, yeah. so um, first was like women's rights because yeah. I was oh, wow. you know, really like, yeah, you know, because of the inheritance thing, I was just like, it doesn't make sense. Why yeah. Why is it that a woman is not getting like what she's supposed to get? Like, you're yeah. getting like, it's 
you know, compared to a man, like how is this even possible? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that was one. Um, also, I think another thing was, um, what was it? Let me just remember. So, so by this point, what you, you mm-hmm. had actually left Islam completely. You mm-hmm. had been reading a lot of blogs, like you said, my blog, you were watching mm-hmm. videos. So you had like a really good understanding of all of the bad things in Islam. Well, not all of them, but like no. you know, a lot of the major points that were bothering you. Did mm-hmm. these, are these the reasons why you left Islam? Or did you find out these things after leaving Islam? Because in my case, sometimes people ask me, well, how come you have like 10,000 arguments against Islam? But when you left Islam, you had like, I don't know, five or something, right? Yeah. Like, well, that's what happens when you research. You find yeah. more issues. You find more issues. But there's a lot of issues. Yeah. You don't need you don't need ten thousand issues. You just need one. Like I think, th- like, if someone asks me for one argument, I can just give them one one mistake in the Quran and it's done. It's yeah, done, yeah. right? <laughs> but like, if you research it, you you find more. You you yeah, find a lot more problems, right? So yeah. so. Are these the issues that caused you to leave Islam or these were the issues you wanted to present to your mom and dad? Did you want them to leave Islam too or you just wanted them to understand you? Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted them to understand me. I didn't want them to leave Islam. Like I know, you know, to them it's a very precious precious um, thing, you know, to, to, to be following, um, which I'm totally fine with. Like, you know, as long as it doesn't like impede me from what I want to do in life, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, which usually it would not. So I... I don't think I'll ever like find in crossroads that that would be a problem. Um, so, in terms of uh, my reasoning, yes, as you said, like during when you are actually researching this, you know, you find more and more problems, and you're like, like, why am I even still following this? You know, in the beginning, you feel like, like for me, I wanted to leave Islam because of the restrictions. I would say that is put on to, to a Muslim woman, yeah. uh, especially the job and you know, the expectations of, of, of upholding the religion uh, and making sure that this is, that you are representing the religion, really. Yeah, but you, like, you took off the hijab though. So the hijab, like you already took off the hijab. So that, that wouldn't have let you, why would that make you leave Islam when you already weren't wearing it? Oh, no, no. As in like, um, my parents didn't know that I was sneakily removing the hijab. Like, the only time that they understood that I'm not wearing a hijab anymore is when uh, essentially I told them, like, you know, it, it was like a two-part thing. Right. So yeah. I told them I, I wasn't going to wear it. And then after the presentation. Um, so in this sense, uh, for me, like if, okay, if I were to like take a step back and kind of like branch out like the two scenarios that could have happened, A is that I would have, uh, remove my hijab, told my parents that I'm, you know, not going to wear it, but still be Muslim. I think that eventually they would still want me to wear it. And if I were to get, for example, married uh, to a person who, let's say, who is not a Muslim, mm. that the idea is still not, com- like, they won't be comfortable with it. Like, they would oh, yeah. totally want me to, to coax my partner to convert into Islam. So this is something that I just wasn't comfortable with and you know i was thinking in that sense like if i were to not leave islam now then no matter what sort of like decision i would do in the future it would still kind of impact me in some way that i did not want but isn't it the case that you could wear hijab or not wear hijab you know pray or not pray and still be muslim like it to me it seems like there was something else not just a hijab like something deeper that made you 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 were questioning and like the the, the belief system of, of the mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. is it was it like a fundamental belief you didn't believe in like yeah like, i would suppose so i mean now that you're digging deeper um i haven't you know like it's been a long time since i've <laughs> you know got into this hate space because you yeah. know it's like when you're questioning you really like oh, think yeah. about it so yeah. uh, let me get back into that zone so in this case, I would say that uh, in terms of the fundamental belief, in terms of submitting, this is the, th- the thing that I you know, feel is not really something that I like. Or like, for example, uh, like uh, the free will that you have is something that like, like you need to believe in God, but you also have the free will to do whatever it is to achieve, you know, whatever um, uh, that God is able to give you, right? Something like that. So in my case, like I've always believed like 
that uh, whatever you do in life, in, in terms of like free will, uh, eventually God will like in terms of fate. Like mm. if if you if something bad happened to you, it's because God wanted it to happen to you, and you have to take it or you have to 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 you know do something about it in a way that is you know either positive or negative for you. But mm -hmm. essentially, uh, you're still putting it in terms of oh God did this to you. Like yeah. it's not like you're the one who you know how how is it that you have done so many things right you know in like a uh, like let's say um like a okay maybe you want to get get a i don't know like go, go to go to go to the park something like this okay. you want to have a good time yeah. and then you go and take the bus uh and you know, okay that's fine and then for some reason the bus got into an accident and mm -hmm. then like in that idea it's like okay god made this accident happen yeah so in this case like what uh i i i should just accept this you know in, in this case then it's like oh maybe like it's a sign that i shouldn't be going to the park something like this. it's like so i for me i i never really liked that um sort of idea i i believe in free will or, mm. um you know and especially in terms of um uh that is would, would then intertwine into this other topic which is um god is giving you problems or god is giving you trials and tribulations because you've done something bad in the past mm. so you need to go through this because it's a trial by god and you want uh you know god is essentially um like That's testing cool. you yeah, yeah, testing, testing your strength, testing your your faith. Um, so you're like, what kind of reasoning is this? This is something that I I truly don't agree with. Um, and also in terms of like, for example, uh, especially in Islam, like uh, gays or uh, people who are non-binary, you know, LGBTQ plus. Um, this is something that when I was growing up, my parents were quite against. So, you know, me growing up and understanding, like, you know, there are some people in my school that are, you know, lesbians. And for me, like, I didn't have a problem with this. Like, I'm yeah. totally cool. Like, yeah, I mean, and they're Muslims. So I'm like, yeah, it's not a problem. Like, okay. You know, for me, like, I didn't find anything wrong with that. Yeah. But then if you really follow the, the scriptures, or the the way that Islamic law works, you you just find that it's against such people, and yeah. for me, I just couldn't agree with that. Okay. Um, and for me as well, like the hypocrisy of people saying like, oh no, um, we accept uh, people who are like this, but then don't really talk about the laws. You know the Islamic laws about that. Oh yeah. For me, that's really hypocritical. Like, how can you, you know, be for LGBTQ plus, but then not even question your own faith that is against um, yeah. this group of people? Like, for yeah. me, I just don't agree with that. Yeah. It's, yeah. The it's, punishment uh, for obviously for homosexuals, at least mm -hmm. men. I don't know about women, but is to be you know thrown off the rooftops in Sunni Islam, right? So it's mm -hmm. it's pretty severe punishment. So you found so you found an inconsistency between. Uh, let's call it human nature and what this religion was teaching. What about the science? Did you find issues with it? Because you said you found my blog scientific. Were right. there scientific issues as well at all? Or was it just like you felt like this this religion was incompatible with the modern world and the way I wanted to live? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say there's scientific uh, reasons as well. For example, um, the way with um, how a, a child is conceived, it's like, okay, a clot of blood. Like, okay, yeah. 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 <laughs> and like how I mean I understand that women menstruate but I yeah. mean if you don't have this and that you're not gonna have a baby you know which um, is funny because um, the Quran doesn't mention the female egg and but yet Muslims use this as a miracle like look it's a yeah. miraculous explanation <laughs> of embryology like as if Muhammad couldn't have seen like an embryo of like a duck or I don't know if they had ducks, maybe goat or something. Yeah. <laughs> a duck, I don't know if I thought of a duck. So this one that came to mind. So so this is what happened. You 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 felt that Islam was false. You left Islam. You told your family you weren't going to wear a hijab. 
they uh, were in shock, but you were still living with them. And then eventually you told them. Yeah. Uh, so you were living them. with them or you left home first? What happened? No, no, no. no. I, I told them um, when I was living with them. And I think I when I told them about the, you know, removing the hijab, I also, uh, at the same night. So it's like oh. the film is on the same night. So oh, like, them, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, in this case, uh, then they were like, oh, okay. Hmm. Um, yeah, a lot of crying, I can tell you that, uh, for me as well, because I just felt really bad, you know, seeing them cry, like, uh, so, I was, I would say it was heartbreaking, um, and, you know, it's very difficult, especially for my mom, um, and during that time, I just remember really, like, hugging her, just to console her, you know, like, I definitely understand that this is something that she doesn't want but if i don't do this then it's just not going to happen and i'm just going to live my life as a person who's really unhappy yeah um, and i don't want that so um uh, when i after i told them uh the next few months really uh was unpleasant like really psychologically unpleasant um and also very hard because uh my whole family didn't really speak to me much okay. because yeah, my relationship with my family is actually really good like before then uh like we would joke around and i, I would talk to my dad a lot um and but uh after that night i would say uh, it was difficult for them to talk to me uh i suppose it is with comes with the shock uh as yeah. well as not being able to understand how to really talk about the, the issue or to uh, or they probably haven't had anyone else or, or seen any other family who go who who had went through this sort of experience or or um, like a, like a, as an example or a reference like how did they handle this like you know a positive you know example or at least some form of a um, a way that they can be like oh okay so this is something that does happen you know because for them it must be like how can she leave? You know, how can she leave? There are no other Muslims that we know of that has left. So yeah, yeah uh, that's true. From the from yeah. their perspective, being older, they're not. They don't probably go on YouTube. They don't have exposure in the schools. Mm -hmm. And you know, you you actually our generation is so different than their generation, right? Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I, I get that. Under, that's understandable. I know other ex-Muslims that you know. I feel like. It's unfortunate they didn't tell their parents in, and they're in the forties and some of them in the I don't I don't know maybe even fifties and they don't mm -hmm. want to tell their parents because mm -hmm. in their situation they they're able to do that. For me, I I'm like you. I just I couldn't do that. I have to tell them because I can't live this sort of I can't pretend I can't pretend to pray and pretend to do all these things. I just can't do it, you know. And yeah. it's, it's it's more difficult in a Muslim society. Mm -hmm. um, like in your your case, it it's even more difficult. In my case, like. I'm in Canada, so if I eat in Ramadan, it doesn't affect me in any way. If I, there's no mm -hmm. hijab, I have to take off. No one's going to notice, you know, all those things. So it's a little bit different situation. Uh, so I understand that. So you told them there's a lot of crying because, of course, they think you're going to go to hell. That's why they're crying. Right? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, like, oh, uh, like, no way. Uh, and, you know, especially after my, uh, because I wasn't, you know, then since I've already told them I, like that I wasn't going to wear the hijab, I would go out without wearing the hijab because, yeah. you know, I already told them. So, yeah. um, like, that for me was, like, a relief because then I wouldn't have to go through a hassle, <laughs> you know, putting all on. No. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, yeah, man, leading a double life is really hard. And, you know, for those who are, you know, stay strong, you'll get there, okay? Um, so, in a sense where, um, in a way, my life kind of got easier. But then the psychological, um, like, not challenges yeah challenges of not being able to like speak to them properly like you know even though i'm talking to them like they kind of like ignore me or like you know kind of yeah uh, like like you know think of me as a ghost or something in the house it's really difficult um to to experience that and for my um uh my mom uh would say that it was especially difficult for her because she felt that she could bring me back mm. uh to islam uh, especially, you know, she was like, you know, she's been really extremely nice. Um, like that I've never really like experienced before. So for me, it's just really weird to see my mom 
to be like extremely nice in that in the way that she was like yeah, yeah because she wanted to bring me back oh, so wow. i was just like okay weird um so uh, in this case she you know like would say oh um let's uh you know meet up with uh and uh and ustas and imam um, yeah, yeah yeah so i was just like no <laughs> we, yeah like you know it, it it's good that singapore in you know, a way is a secular country because yeah. then they wouldn't like kidnap me and bring it to oh, some yeah. stuff like that yeah. that is really crazy yeah. and i'm just like you know when i'm hearing these stories i'm just like i feel really grateful that yeah. I, you know, was in Singapore yeah. uh, at the time. So uh, in this case, you know, I was just like, like I can simply just tell her like, uh, no, like you know, unfortunately, I'm not, I'm not gonna do this. Um, and for my mom, like uh, there was this one time where uh, essentially I was, you know, reading a bit more about FGM and stuff like this. Uh, I understood that you know, for in Singapore, like, okay, yeah, we call it Sunak Prom Fund, uh, FGM. Uh, and in Singapore, it's practiced in a way where it's just a, a prick, like, to the criteria. Um, So, it, like, for me, you know, growing up, I didn't really think about it much, but I knew that this practice existed. But I didn't realize that I was one of the victims. Uh -huh. So when I was, you know, reading a bit more about FGM and that it actually happens to, like, even, you know, right now, like, modern day age and two baby girls i was just like hmm, okay so i um confronted my mom like hey um have i gone through you know suna pom yeah and then she was like yeah you know like she was very frank about it like yeah you did and i was like okay um and i asked her like why did she you know um like allow this yeah uh, and she was like giving me the the reasonings of oh you know is to avoid zina it's to uh <laughs> okay. it's to, yeah it's to like you know prevent a, a person to be like uh, promiscuous and stuff like this so i was just like mm, okay yeah so it like so that really solidified like my stance against is against islam like yeah. the fact that she the fact that she like really believed that doing this to a, a baby girl is something that will be useful for them in the future like i was just like done you know i was yeah. done with um, like i was like it really um uh, solidified my stance i was just yeah. like okay all this yeah so wow yeah um i'm glad they don't do that in canada like that's is how where do they do this in the hospitals yeah they were doing like muslim clinics okay. so yeah yeah so in Jeez. this case for example there's like what from what i was researching when i was doing like my videos on this particular topic was that like at least there are like two clinics that i can find online where they clearly state like okay we can do this for you um and i was just like what the heck is happening like why is it that is yeah this, is this legal yeah it is so this is the thing right singapore is such uh it like you know if it, it's not a third world country it's like a first world country gdp is high and everything uh international country so the fact that this practice is legal just blows my mind like just why is it even crazy legal? this is crazy yeah, yeah exactly. like, I, there's obviously zero health benefit to this and you know with with male circumcision it's not even like it's still legal here in canada but it's mm -hmm. not it's the the official uh american uh you know i think american pediatric i mean i'm that's the one i'm quoting because i know it, not the canadian one association mm -hmm. has has uh, advised against routine infant circumcision male circumcision mm -hmm. because uh there's it's not really like th there might be some sort of health benefits but overall the harm is more than the the so-called benefit there's no real reason to you know to yeah. cut babies in my opinion um mm -hmm. and and so it's become less and it's becoming less and less common it's definitely something that you know it's a it's it's a leftover a, vest, a vestige of um that you know abraham the story of abraham and how he mm -hmm. circumcised himself and all that mm -hmm. but um yeah I, don't, I definitely think when it comes to doing something like that to to control you know women's sexuality it's just such a stupid stupid thing and even for men too it, it even for men it, it can reduce sexuality and mm -hmm. feeling and all of that mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. definitely and, and i know this is an argument for cleanliness and whatever but you know obviously we were made the way that makes sense there's no need to 
I'm sure there's some cases where for men, you know, maybe circumcision makes sense. Some babies, maybe, maybe there's some cases, I don't know, but to do it, you know, routine to every single child is, it just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's, yeah. it's dogma. That's what dogma is. Yes. Dogma is something that you do not because it makes sense, just because mm -hmm. it's, you just do it because it's a belief you have, right? You hold that belief because of, mm -hmm. you know, appeal to some supernatural or whatever. So yeah, that's, that's, that's unfortunate. Like even when I found out about FGM as a Muslim sort of convert, you know, I converted from Ismaili to Sunni mm -hmm. and Ismailis, Ismailis do it too, but like Sunnis, when I, when I looked into it and I, I found out that at, when I found out about FGM, not, not, not male circumcision, I was mm -hmm. like, I couldn't believe that because I knew FGM is a really bad thing. Mm -hmm. I knew that. And when I found out it was like sort of encouraged, there's some hadith that say that you can do it, but don't do too much or something. And I know it's all over the Muslim countries. They do FGM. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can't, like, I can't believe this is Islamic. This doesn't make sense to me. And it was, it was one of those, there's, there's very few examples, but this was one example where as a Muslim, I had cognitive dissonance and I'm like, this can't be part of Islam. Yeah. And I'm just like, nah, I must be weak or must be. And if I, and because I was in Canada, I was able to hold that position because I didn't know anyone that has been through this. I know in Canada, no one does it. So I'm like, yeah, it's nothing to do with Islam. You know, I'm like, yeah, it's privilege, yeah. privileged Muslim living in the West that knows nothing about what's going on to young women in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. And of course it's women that do it, right? It's the moms. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like, um, I think, uh, for example, in Malaysia, Indonesia, um, in Singapore, it's not really about like honor in some like countries. For example, I, I believe in uh, Africa, um, especially in Muslims who are living there, uh, it's more, it's, you know, tied in with uh, like honor of the family, something like this. But in the Asian like region, uh, it's mostly about uh, like following the doctrine um, and just also because of you know not being promiscuous or not letting the woman be promiscuous um and usually this is done by uh female doctors um and i would say in terms of um like i'm not sure like how like uh how much a man can influence the decision but uh like for me i, I would say like the woman is usually the one that has like the final say in, wow. in terms of this yeah it's crazy um, yeah that and, is crazy and so can you can you explain why why do they say this take makes this controls promiscuity what's the thinking behind that i think the thinking about it is essentially like to to prevent like sex before marriage yeah like essentially that that's like the main what's thing the right what's the connection between those two things like fgm and sex before marriage i mean you could still oh have yeah, yeah yeah like uh as in what they want is to make sure like okay if this uh girl who grows up into a woman doesn't really like feel the need to for example mm. masturbate or whatever like you know and have like that sexual uh, need then uh, they would not be so prone to, I suppose, look for uh, a partner or a person that could go further, right? Um, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, okay. so, so it goes back yeah. to the honor thing as well in some yeah, cultures. Yeah. Where the woman, the woman's vagina is seen mm -hmm. as the 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 place where the family's honor resides, which is so ridiculous. <laughs> so of course, the man can go and do whatever he wants. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like, yeah, okay so weird right it's so messed mm -hmm. up mm -hmm. these are the type of ideas we want to fight and this is why you know talking to you do you do you have any videos on fgm on your channel oh yeah uh, i have oh. a series i talked oh. to a um yeah there, there was like one of my first few series oh. um so my editing was a bit shit back then just letting you guys know if you guys go there <laughs> to watch that fgm series um i had an interview with a uh, very prominent anti-fgm uh, speaker uh, if you scroll down, then you'll be able to see it uh, too from, yeah, there it oh, is. Yeah, in developed countries. Yeah. Um, so I do talk about uh, Singapore in depth, uh, as well as the Muslim reaction about, um, you know, when a non-Muslim DJ actually like asked, the, like posted on her Facebook, like, hey, why is this happening in Singapore? And like uh, a lot of backlash like happened to her. Uh, from Muslims um, and I was just like you know this should be covered and this should be uh, you know talked about in Singapore um, because it's still legal and you know I do talk to the, the Filza um, who is the anti-FGM um, spokesperson 
just really amazing woman. Uh, she really talks about this and uh, she promotes like uh, women's rights as well as, um, you know, making sure that uh, domestic abuse, uh, like the, the implications of that. Um, she helps women, women who are in this sort, this sort of uh, like positions to, to talk about it with them and to help them get into a better headspace. Uh, mm-hmm. and eventually get out of such situations. So she's just an amazing woman, Phil uh, Sumartono. Um, and uh, in, the, in the interview, I spoke to her and she gave me a lot of facts. And the thing is, it's really interesting, is that um, because in Singapore, you have a lot of races. So you have like Chinese, you have uh, Malays, Indians, um, you know, then you have like Caucasians and whoever else. Um, so in Singapore, you have uh, the... Malay Muslims, that which is usually the majority of the Muslim community, and then you do have Indian Muslims. And in, what we've seen is that Indian Muslims don't do this practice, which to me really is interesting um, to to understand. Oh, so wow. yeah, yeah, for me it was like, what? Like like this is uh, interesting to understand because they don't do it, and this other like you know uh, branch does it. Um, so I was just like, huh, interesting. I believe, uh, the Indian Muslims in Singapore follow Hanafi, um, school, uh, yeah, school. yeah, yeah. So that's probably one of the reasons why, uh, oh, they do this. Yeah. So, so wow. That was, that was, uh, I guess disappointing to find out. So you found out about, you found out about that. You talked to your mom. Um, did them, did your relationship with them ever improve or is it still like you had to leave the country? So, you know, in your, in your coming out video, mm-hmm. uh, why I left Islam, mm-hmm. um, you know, you were actually crying, you started crying actually. And so what happened there? Like, why were you crying and were you scared about leaving the country or was, were you scared about what would happen when you came out publicly? What was, what was going on? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in Singapore, I would say like, if you were to come out, um, it's not, like a dangerous thing to do like in some other Muslim countries where, you know, for example, if you are in Indonesia and you're in the Aceh, which is a part of Indonesia where they, they, they do Sharia law, then oh, you'll yeah. probably be killed there, you know, like, yeah. you know, so um, for in Singapore, it's quite safe to come out. Um, the reason you, why- you'd be, killed, you'd be killed, you mean by like the government or by like, like vigilantes? Well, they have the Sharia law. Um, also, the government so, would actually arrest yeah, you. Yeah, in that region. Yeah, in that region. Uh, Aceh, Aceh, right? Yeah, yeah. Aceh, yeah. Um, and, you know, they do lashings there. So it's like uh, pretty crazy, I would say. Um, but uh, in Singapore, if you do come out, um, yay. Yeah, I'm just reading the. <laughs> I, I want to say one thing before you continue because I yeah. actually forgot. I was going to, I wrote it down and I forgot to. Uh-huh. I wanted to mention that I, I I just think that you know as part of the the work that I'm doing I think it's important to highlight that you were able to leave Islam and your family did not actually hurt you in any ways and I want to make oh, that yeah. clear because yeah. there's this idea and I think I think we do a disservice to a movement when we when we make it sound like like everyone that leaves Islam is going to be killed I I, oh, no. I think we need to not over exaggerate that because mm-hmm. we start to sound like drama queens. And, you know, there's people out there that use this in order to sort of like they want immigration, for example. And I always tell people that if you want to immigrate, if you want to leave the country, work hard, build some skills, yeah. like leave on your merit. Don't 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 leave as a refugee. Now, of course, there is situations like this guy I spoke to in Kenya by the name of Hassan. Oh, the, that's not his real name, but he was he tried to hide his apostasy. He was outed by a family member that, mm. that exposed him and he got almost killed. People hit him with a lock twice. He was like literally almost killed and he's lying to them. He said, oh, I'm Muslim now. Nobody cares what he says. They want to kill him. Mm. He's, a, he's a legitimate situation where he needs yeah, to. Yeah. And there's other people, they're like, they go out of the way to sort of create a problem for themselves so then they can leave the country and, they, and they're kind of like, nobody wants to kill them, but they're like trying to provoke a situation. And it's not, you know, obviously you should never be killed. Nobody is justifying that. But we should also be fair and say that there is a situation as well where you are able to leave Islam and your family will not like it, but they're not going to hurt you. And and thankfully, I think as time goes by, there's more and more situations like that. I'm really happy to hear that in your case, your mom was nice to you. And that's that's how Muslims should be, actually. Yeah, right? yeah, you should yeah, try to be nice not like hurt people for leaving Islam because that's not going to help, right? That's not going to convince people to come Yeah, out. that's not like, what, like, I'm going to leave this place, like, no way, you know. Um, but for me, uh, yeah, no one hurt me, thank thank goodness. Um, and, 
you know, uh, it's the most basic thing to do not to hurt your own family member right. or, or the community not to hurt a person, right? So Yeah, it, it just uh, shows you how twisted the like the religious teachings are that it can actually make a person want to harm their own family member. Like the most powerful desire that all us humans have, and I know I'm a parent, is to protect your children even more than yourself because we've we've evolved to want to survive and pass on our genes. Our entire existence is 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 dependent on the you know on this concept that if I didn't want to live and I didn't want to you know get get make a woman pregnant and spread my genes, there would be no human race. So this is one of the most powerful desire that people would jump in front of trains to save the kids. I mean, frankly speaking, that's that's how we are. I mean, I didn't choose that. That's just the way I am. Like I would do that. I would take a bullet from my kids, but somehow this this religious doctrine is so crazy that it's able to overpower that instinct that is so powerful it's just so twisted like it's it's so twisted that it can do that it's 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 overriding you know millions of years of evolutionary programming which is insane right so the fact that that can happen is it's shocking but the fact that it didn't happen i'm, I'm glad it didn't happen that you know people's humanity is still there your, your parents humanity my parents of course like i said they're very liberal so there's not even a question of that the the parental instinct is is obviously way more powerful than the religious sentiment but it's it's unfortunate it can get that bad so so what happened next like so you told your parents um why did you have to leave the country did you have to leave the country or you just wanted to i, I wanted to um like you know because i felt a it's like i didn't want to leave with my family because it was just really heartbreaking to like be a ghost oh. like they would really, like not talk to me even if like i'm you know, just passing by or whatever. It just felt really extremely lonely. And you know how loneliness can, you know, it does penetrate. And um, you you have a lot of, like, mental instability uh, yeah. when you have a sort of, like, situation. Yeah. Um, so, I like, for me, I felt like this is not a good situation. I need to get out um, because if I, you know, if I go through this, like, in a prolonged time period, then how am I supposed to... Uh, leave the way that I want to leave. So in this sense, I decided to uh, leave the country. Um, so I, you know, traveled to multiple places. For example, Thailand. Uh, went to Hong Kong as well. Uh, so I was uh, based uh, in Thailand, and then after I moved around, like uh, traveling, mm -hmm. and uh, then I went on to other like countries. For example, to Europe. Um, and yeah, uh, that's how my life has been. Uh, right. yeah. So, but throughout, um, you know, I, like, you know, in the beginning stages, um, keep, keeping contact with family was something that, uh, I mean, we do have like a family WhatsApp group, so that's really nice. Like I'm still part of it. Um, so it's really, you know, good to see like, uh, what's happening and stuff like this. But sometimes I do like, uh, for example, you know, like um, send like a reply to something or to bring up a, a topic and there's just no replies. Mm -hmm. So you're like totally ignored even in the chat. So you're yeah. like, okay, you know, like there's really nothing you can do if the other party doesn't want that. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, um, they don't know how to cope with this. Uh, you leaving Islam. I, ha I have a little bit of that experience, not as much as you, but um like I, I was really close to one of my uncles and he was a um, really nice uncle. And he's, he was one of the more religious ones in the family. And I actually told him the funny thing. I told him not to buy a house on mortgage and this and that is so funny. I said, no, no, it's haram. You need to be, have clean and use this Islamic mortgage, which is twice as expensive. And, uh, but after I left Islam, it was just, it's just very awkward with him. The other uncle that's still in Kenya. I don't know how to, they don't know what to say to me. They don't know how to, Thankfully, my dad wasn't like that. My mom's not like that. So they're able to communicate with me and still be, keep the relationship. Um, and sometimes over the time, you know, those of you who are in that situation, I'm glad you brought it up for other people as well. Things do improve over time. Sometimes they sometimes they'll come to a point where they they accept what happened and they're mm -hmm. able to cope with it and move on. Mm -hmm. uh, but it sucks, you know, to be in that situation. For me, my entire circle of friends who are Muslim, all of them, not, none of them, I don't talk to any of them anymore because I, I can't, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I do feel that I understand that pain. And, you know, thankfully you're younger and you can build, you know, new, and not even me, I'm not that old, but, <laughs> but you can build a new circle of friends, right? You can, you can build new friendships, you can yeah. build a relationship, you can set up your life the way you want to. 
um I, how do you like you don't have to answer this but like how do you survive financially then if your parents are not supporting you anymore and you're moving around and i you can talk about it if you want to if you don't want to yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for me i do like transcribing this is something oh. i do um so you work yeah. online then yeah, yeah, I work online oh. um, as well as uh, what else do I do? Oh, yeah, I also do English teaching as well um, to international students. Uh, so sometimes from Russia, it's really it, actually this is a really good way to like see the the world in other people's like lenses because when you're, when you're talking to them and you you know like teaching them English, you ask you you essentially what I do is that I let them talk and I'll correct their yeah. English. And at the same time, I'll ask them the questions that really intrigues, um, like that is intriguing to me in, in regards to their country and what they think about certain things. Oh. So sometimes I'll do like a, the same question, but for say, like five people from different regions of the world, and you get so such different answers, and it's just amazing. And sometimes you get very similar answers. So you know that's also like quite interesting in the sense where. You know, you guys are all from different parts of the world, but you guys are thinking the same thing. <laughs> so it's like, what? Well, yeah. So that's what I do. Um, other than this, what else? Uh, I mean, I do YouTube, but that doesn't make me money. I don't make okay. any money from it at all. Uh, actually, it takes away money. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe at some point you can monetize it and make some money on that, though. I don't know. Like YouTube, YouTube's algorithm is, uh, especially for my content, that's yeah. a bit... You know, oh, in a way, yeah, yeah. So the uh, I appreciate um, it's difficult for me to monetize it. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, you never and, know. You you definitely have that skill set, and um, you know you definitely have the editing skill set. You definitely have documentary making. All of those things, I think, are, are very valuable skills to have. Um, I'm trying mm -hmm. to teach my kids to do editing as well. Oh so. <laughs> so so uh let's 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 um because we've been going on for a long time let's let's continue a little bit more and then we'll we'll end it off on mm -hmm. that so um so you wanted to leave the country and travel did you find that seeing other cultures made you feel more more comfortable with your decision to leave islam or, because i think a lot of times when you're living in one country and all you see is that your perspective can be kind of more narrow but when you travel you get to see more countries and you get to see the issues that exist in other countries as well mm -hmm. do you find that that broadened your perspective in terms of how you see religion and you know islam i think, I think not so much in a way like because singapore is quite multicultural already oh so you, yeah you're, like, you're always seeing like other religions anyway so for example uh like uh you know um that's like the seventh um Luna month where for example the buddhist people um or or chinese majority in in singapore uh who are practicing what they would do uh is that during this month is that it's called like the um, what uh seven luna month um something about like ghosts or something like this so oh, okay. essentially yeah. what happens in, in this month in their uh belief is that um, the, the gates of hell will open so that all the spirits and souls inside there will essentially, you know, they are able to roam the middle earth and they'll, they are able to check out like what's happening, you know, what's going <laughs> down, what's going down in this world and uh, see their family and stuff like this. So uh, during this month, um, what uh, people would do is that they would um, like, they would buy, you know, in, in, in this religion culture they will buy like um uh paper that is like hell money in this sense <laughs> so they will burn this hell money and and uh you know whatever you burn essentially this will go to wherever the the people who they are you know trying to get this gift to yeah yeah hungry ghost festival sorry yeah. i totally forgot for some reason yeah so this is called the hungry ghost festival and during this month you also see for example like performances um so during this like um like maybe it's a small tent and that's like a, a platform like a stage mm -hmm. And there will be like performances. So they would put out sh chairs, like, you know, the red plastic chairs. Um, and at the back, there'll be like normal people. But at the front, it's totally empty. They're <laughs> living it for the, the ghost, you know, the, the souls and yeah. everything. So for me, like seeing this, uh, like, you know, another culture, like for me, it's it's quite oh. cool, you know. So um, uh, I get a mix of 
you know, understanding of uh, Hinduism, especially if you go to like a little India. Oh, yeah. um, and you also um, like you, you see Sikhs, for example, as well. So, you, you know, you learn that as well um, in Singapore. But wow. uh, so it's quite multicultural. Um, oh. Race or racism is a different topic. So I'm not going to go into that because it is quite hot right there. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, so yeah, uh, for me, in terms of traveling, uh, I would say that going to Europe was a different experience. Oh, yeah. um, the reason being is that like, you know, I'm very familiar with Asia, like totally, you know, it's not something that's totally uh, bizarre or something that is uh, um, away from the roots, for example. But uh, when I was growing up, my parents would be telling me like something like, uh, especially if it's, you know, on the television, they were talking about, oh, look at all these white people, like, uh, and, and talking smack about essentially uh, the, 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 well, uh, people who are either European or, or American. <laughs> mm. um, so when I went to Europe, you yeah, know, there were there were these like uh, ideas of um, a white person being uh, greater than uh, a local person. This is like the mindset of how it is in Asia, especially for example in Thailand, where this like being white is something that is important, or being fair skin is something that is important. So. For me, I just, when I went to Europe, I was like, yeah, well, they're just like normal people. Like there's nothing special yeah. about them. You know, like what, like what, why, why, why are we even like bringing this up to like the children? Why are we even talking about white people as if they're like some sort of um, like uh, powerful or or like- uh, Something special, like uh, something special. Just, a different, just a different color. That's why my camera died there. Um, so yeah, if my camera gets disconnected, it's because it's overheating. I'm still here. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so definitely having living in a multicultural society, I think is very advantageous to Muslims and non-Muslims, everybody, because you get to see that there's more than one religion and you get to have empathy for other people and to see that, you know, there's different cultures and different, and all of these different belief systems makes you actually sometimes realize that my own belief system is nothing special because look, these guys are doing different things. Whereas sometimes when you're born into a certain system you don't realize that oh this is not this is you think this is just the only possibility yeah. you know what i mean yeah it's not homogeneous yeah uh, in, you know mostly muslim majority countries uh, for example uh in indonesia i believe it's more muslim majority i mean there are uh like christians but um you know right now i mean in the past indonesia has been quite uh, like open, open-minded, and they're more of like, oh yes, it's Indonesian. It's not like, oh, it's a Muslim Indonesian country. But uh, right now, it's more going into towards like the Islamic side, I would say. Um, oh, really? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it can be a bit so dangerous. They're, they're becoming more Islamicized, you think? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Oh, wow. Um, it, and it just means it's more important for people like you and others to come out and to show that, you know, you can leave Islam. How is your life now? Just, just so we can uh, finish up, because I don't know how much time you have left. How is your life now that you left Islam? Obviously, there's this very painful period of coming out. You you know, you told everybody, you made you, you made a video on your channel, even though your channel is not about that. Mm -hmm. But you did, you know, authentically come out and, and say your, what you believe. How is your life now that you've that you've left Islam? Your family, like, you you know, you've told us that it's it's difficult because, you know, they, there's a bit of awkwardness, mm -hmm. there's a bit, of, a bit of coldness over there. But other than that, how is your life now? I would say it's great. Like, I mean, other than this COVID, COVID yeah. situation, yeah. You know, I, mean, I love traveling. So this is like, ah. but um, uh, my life, I would say, has been uh, pretty hectic for the past few months. But as in, like, from from what 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 was it? When was I there? Uh, when I was in Portugal, essentially, mm -hmm. like like that. Those that time period was really, really hectic. Um, and I'm not sure if I'm going to make a video on it, but uh, I did make a video of what I've seen in Portugal, yeah. uh, which is in regards to the like um, China, uh, China's influences on Portugal. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for me, I would say like my life after living in Islam is better because I can now focus on things that I truly care about. You know, nice. uh, especially towards other people. Uh, you know, like someone was saying 
something about uh, the CCP. And yeah. I, like, I, I just want to like point out something. Um, where is it? Oh, CCP here. CCP is imploding something? Uh, CCP is essentially uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And it says over here, this person, uh, Gwyn Paladin, is saying, why are we politically correct, guys? Why not love the solutions of CCP, seriously? Mm -hmm. In um, Mimi's world, uh, it's their only, uh, their way only. But wake up, guys. Um, I would, you know, just want to point out that um, we, I am an ex-Muslim, and I believe that you would agree with this. Even though we are ex-Muslims, we do not tolerate any so so before you answer what, what this guy is saying is he's saying we should put the muslims in camps that's oh, what he's saying yeah. right yeah. It's him, it's so go ahead. So now it's you can explain why thing. why that's yeah. bad so you know we don't tolerate such things we don't tolerate putting muslims in camps this is something that's inhumane it's against a human right you know let's you know it's it's like it's the similar thing to uh what happened with the jews we don't want such things to be happening again because they are human. Why do, you know, like, I, I don't believe in putting anyone in, in a camp or to make them work, make them, you know, to sterilize a woman because of their faith. Uh, this is something that is really horrible. I find it really disgusting and I really hate it. And the fact that, you know, like some people do say this, uh, that, oh, if you're an ex-Muslim, why don't you uh, agree to such solutions? No, that's not who we are. Like, this is what I'm, I'm saying. Yeah. This, is not, yeah, this is not what being an ex-Muslim is. I'm pretty what, sure. I have a feeling that... Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no. I was just saying I have a strong feeling this person is a, is a never moose and was never an ex-Muslim, is not mm -hmm. someone that has Muslim family members because it's very rare to find someone so far right among mm. ex-Muslims because mm. we have Muslim family members and I mean, it'd be very strange for you to want to like treat your own family members like this. Um, you, you know, honestly, Gwyn Paladin, you're a disgusting piece of shit. So I, I just got to say it. You, that's what yeah. you are. You're a disgusting piece of shit. Um, you know, what China is doing is wrong, period. I don't care yeah. how much you hate Islam. Yeah. It has nothing to do with it. At the end of the day, it has nothing to do with Islam. It's it's them suppressing that ethnic minority. It, Islam is just yeah. part of the issue, um, I think. It's not because there's Muslims in China, main, mainland China, and they don't have problems like this. It's mm -hmm. that specific separated Region. sort of issue that's going yeah. on where they want yeah. they want to separate, they want to be their own country, whatever. And you know, China also has issues with Tibet, right? China has and also Mongolia. Mm -hmm. and, and Mongo and I don't even know, really know the whole thing. And those of you who, who want to know more about this, definitely subscribe to Fatally Honest's channel, Rose's channel. And you know that comes to another point. I'm just you know honestly, we I think everything I stand for is against what this guy is saying. Yeah. And I thought I I think I made that very very clear for anyone mm -hmm. that subscribes here. It's not about political correctness. It's about this is just evil what you're saying. Like mm -hmm. you're basically being a Nazi here. Right? Basically, this is Nazism. Yeah, exactly. Like this is like. Straight up Nazism. Sorry. Um, so back to the posit positivity. Uh, you know, you mentioned something to me before we started talking, which is, I think, very important. Your channel is not an ex-Muslim channel. And mm -hmm. ex-Muslim is not what you are, is not the entirety of who you are. You are so much more than that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, in terms of this, I don't believe in, like, labeling my, my whole entire personality as an ex-Muslim. Like, this is, I don't think any ex-Muslim wants to be labeled that way either because there's so much more than that. Um, you know, your life does not revolve around Islam after you're an ex-Muslim, though you do want to talk about it because you want to let other people know your story, let them be, you know, understand like, hey, if you're going to through the same experience, you're actually able to connect with me and understand what is happening. You're not alone. You know, so this is this is why people do talk about the stories as an ex-Muslim. Um, as in in terms of uh, my like uh, identity, uh, I, I'm more than an ex-Muslim, and I would say that I'm uh, very pro-human rights. It's 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 very clear. Um, I'm also a person who likes to understand the deeper parts of humanity. Uh, especially people who, let's, for example, I do have like a video about a gigolo who does his work, you know, and he, who does 
for example, gay for pay. This is something that he does as a work. Um, and I talk to him about it. I want to know more. Why does he do it? You know, is it for the money? Um, like, how does he, you know, coincide that world? And how does he um, traverse, like, not being able to even talk about it? Because it's something that no one will, you know, people will be, like, interested in him, but he doesn't want that. He wants to talk to people, to, to, uh, to uh, you know, let people share their stories with him. Um, and my platform is uh, Faithfully Honest is a platform where I also do talk about uh, very important things, for example, uh, not being able to get divorced in Philippines. Like, you know, that's really insane. You know, that's like another form of uh, religious oppression, I would say, mm -hmm. that's, you know, yep. intertwined into the political system. Is that because of Christianity? Uh, yeah, uh, they're extremely Catholic there. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's one of the main reasons. Um, you know, birth control also was an issue in Philippines, uh, where women just couldn't could not get any. Um, and these are the main you know issues that I want to speak on my channel because I feel that there's not a lot of coverage on it, or you know when people do talk about uh, such things. For example, if I'm bringing it up um, in like a conversation sometimes it's just too much information to take in, which is why I do my videos in the format that they are, mm -hmm. uh, to make it simpler for a person to understand, like, okay, so this happened in this and this and that. So they understand that like, what is the situation um, in regards to, uh, you know, what's happening in their world. Uh, and I've gotten that a lot of uh, Filipinos actually, you know, they, they, you know, I've gotten some positive responses on that because they feel that no one is listening. Uh, you know, it's, when, when, a, when a Western person thinks about Philippines, they don't really think of it as a big country, but it has, what, like, uh, how many billion um, of people? I mean, are, you, are you Filipina? Is people asking ethnic? ethnic oh, no, no, I'm uh, Singaporean. Uh, oh, okay. Malay, Singaporean. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, like, in 2018, the Philippines has like 106.7 million people, and that is also due to, you know, majority of these people are under like the poverty line, um, as well, because you know people just have babies all the time because of the Catholic, um, you know, not being able to de um, do abortions and stuff. Uh, so that is very difficult. Um, you know, I also have another video about um, women's rights in Poland, which is still ongoing right now. Um, so, you know, all of these topics I feel are very, very important, which is why I talk about it um, on the channel. Uh, so yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a nice, um, you know, mesh of things that uh, I feel is important. So Yeah, and uh, absolutely. I mean, I think this is... Um this is so important to highlight that we ex-Muslims were not just ex-Muslims. Sometimes people see someone like me who is an activist and spends a lot of time talking about ex-Muslim issues. They don't realize that the majority of ex-Muslims don't talk about ex-Muslim issues. They, they leave Islam and they do other things. And that's how it should be. We yeah. want to make it so that leaving Islam becomes a non-issue. This conversation that we're having right now, me and you, uh, what what both of us would love to see is a world where we don't have conversations like this because it's like okay I left Islam okay you left Islam okay I yeah. became I became Christian or I became Hindu or I'm not Muslim or I'm atheist so nobody cares it's like yeah okay that's interesting but we don't need to make a video on how difficult it was how your family no longer talks to you how someone how people are kicked out of the home or abused or killed or executed we don't want we don't want that we don't want to talk about these things we, we're mm -hmm. looking for a world where this becomes a non-issue, but we can never just take it for granted, I think. At this point, we have to keep talking about these things. Someone needs to keep doing it, which is why I'm doing it. Um, I'm so glad that you came out and you know you shared your story. This is an, you know, a part of your journey as well. Um, and you know, you are, you know, thankfully in a safe place, a safe country. And I think with time, you know, your family relationship will improve. You know, a lot of times I find when when you have kids, then your your parents will. I've heard from many people that their parents, you know, softened up. They want to see their grandkids, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, things yeah. can change. The dynamics can change over time. Over 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 time, they just realize that not nothing they're gonna do is gonna change your mind, and so they accept it, you know. And I hope that's what will happen with you as well. Yeah. I would hope so too, you know, like, yeah, you know what, if you can't beat it, join it, like, you know, as an embracing, like, the fact that 
I'm, I'm an ex-Muslim. Um, I mean, I, I'm not expecting them to, to leave Islam. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. And, <laughs> and that's an important part too, that we, we don't, we're not expecting other people to actually leave Islam. That's not yeah. the goal necessarily. The goal is to raise awareness to allow people to make their own choices and if they want to be muslim they can be muslim and okay. if they don't want to be muslim they don't have to be they don't they cannot be muslim that's that's what yeah, we want yeah. that's the type of world like, that we want right yeah 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 i agree 100 percent. people should be able to make their own choices really absolutely yeah. absolutely so so just to just to close off then uh before i give you a chance to make any sort of final comments you want to share um if you're new to the channel please consider subscribing and even joining below uh click join now and you can support me for a small amount of money that'll help me to continue growing the channel and to do this maybe full-time one day um also there's patreon if you'd like to support me financially from from that platform that's also really helpful uh, you'll get early access to my videos some of my videos will be posted early and of course you will get you know my eternal gratitude uh guiding someone away from islam is better than 10 camels and that's a hadith you can quote me on <laughs> uh, any any final words rose you want to share any final comments any final thoughts any advice to other people in the closet that, that want to come out or are scared to come out tell the family what would you advise them i'll say that take you know baby steps um this is a very difficult process take your time uh if you don't have time reach out to someone who might be able to help you out okay uh this is very important um especially when you know, if you feel alone, especially when you're in a community that um, is very uh, like you don't have another person who can you you can reach out to, do reach out to organizations um, that are around uh, on you know the internet as well. Uh, their advice will be very helpful for you as well. Um, you know, if even if there's not around, if, if there's not a physical person around you, that idea and that uh, ability to speak to someone who understands and has probably gone through the similar thing as you have will help you in that mental state uh, this is very important I cannot stress it enough um, yeah um, once you are able to leave your family or you know able to tell your family about your decision then take it from there step by step really but yeah that's uh, pretty much it from me. That's uh, beautiful advice. Uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much, uh, Rose. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully we can do this again at some point. Uh, and I, I hope people do check out your channel and subscribe to your channel. And uh, you're doing some interesting content there. And uh, definitely, I think you can make money on your channel at some point, I, even though it's very controversial content. I think there's either maybe Patreon or something else. But um, the documentary skills are, are useful. Maybe maybe you'll make a documentary on ex-Muslims. Who knows? Oh, yeah. Uh, Actually, that would be really interesting to do. I, uh, I, um, I, would, I would definitely like to do that, uh, actually. But uh, not right now because of the current pandemic yes. situation. <laughs> absolutely and and so this has been a, a great conversation thank you everyone for joining us uh episode 64 of the abdullah samir podcast and um just if you have if you don't know it's available on itunes stitcher spotify you can you can subscribe there and also be notified and there's also no obviously no ads on there and it's not monetized in any way so it's just for your own convenience if you if you find it difficult to watch on youtube obviously youtube is my main platform and that's where i have the most subscribers but just to make it easier for other people i've set set this up so please do subscribe there and if i see people watching and listening on there i will continue uploading it on there so please do to check that out as well thank you uh thank you those and uh thanks everyone and uh we'll see you again stay Bye. safe Stay safe. Bye.